Okay, this is Civil War Objective 2 about how the Union takes control of the Civil War in the year 1863. And remember that the years 1861 up to 1863 had not been good. Uh, they lose at the, the Union loses at the Battle of Bull Run uh, when they were supposed to dominate. Lincoln goes through a bunch of generals. Uh, he finally gets what he considers a, a, a victory, if you will, at Antietam Creek. And uh, things seem to be going pretty well. Unfortunately, right after that, battle at Antietam Creek, in December of 1862, heading into the spring of 1863, they're dealing with another problem. Robert E. Lee is on a hot streak. Now if you take a look here, down in this area of Virginia, Fredericksburg, Robert E. Lee takes this battle in December on December 13th, 1862. Now in that battle, Lee defeats uh, Lincoln's new Union general, Ambrose Burnside. Now, just on a side note here, take a look at the whiskers that he's got there. Those were pretty big whiskers even for that time when a lot of people had a similar style, and so his troops start referring to him as sideburns, which is a term we still use for them today. The name originates with General Ambrose Burnside. Now, after the loss at Fredericksburg, Lincoln is not very pleased, so he replaces Burnside with this guy, a guy named Fighting Joe Hooker. Now, uh, Joe Hooker had been fighting in the West for a little while and bragged that all he ever saw was the enemy's back because it, he kept, the enemy kept running away from him. Well, Robert E. Lee didn't run away from him, and in <laughs> the event of fighting him, Lee beats him right here at Chancellorsville, Virginia, in May of 1863. Now, uh, in that particular battle, it was a great victory for Lee, but he, he took a tragic loss uh, in getting that victory. His right-hand man, Stonewall Jackson, dies in the battle. And the th thing that was unfortunate and tragic for the South was that Jackson was accidentally killed by his own men. He had come around a turn at dusk when the sun was coming down and gun smoke was everywhere, and he got shot by his own guys. Great victory for Lee, but a tragic loss as well. Well, Lincoln, again, of course, is not satisfied with the results at Fredericksburg or Chancellorsville, and that's when this guy gets word at 2 o'clock in the morning that he is going to be the new head of the Union Army. His name is George Meade. He wasn't uh, anything special into, uh, outside of being very scholarly, and uh, history kind of falls into his lap. Fame falls into his lap, because three days into his command, he stumbles across a little town in Pennsylvania called Gettysburg. Now, if you trace Lee's path here, he wins in Frederick, Fredericksburg, then Chancellorsville, and, start making, and starts making his way through Virginia, West Virginia, and just over the border into Pennsylvania. He was actually trying to drive north to uh, attack the north, really for the first time in the Confederate's uh, uh, strategy, I guess, if you will. But he has to stop to look for shoes. A lot of his troops uh, don't have proper footwear. So he goes into Gettysburg to get shoes for the troops, and a Union scout stumbles across him, runs back, and go to, goes and tells Meade where uh, Lee is and what's going on. Now before Lee and his uh, 76,000 troops can get away, uh, Meade shows up with 92,000 Union troops, and the Battle of Gettysburg, a three-day battle in July of 1863, and the most critical battle of the war, is on. The Confederates take position over here, and the Union takes position on the hills over here. Some famous names like Big Round Top and Little Round Top and Cemetery Hill were a big part of the Battle of Gettysburg just south of the town itself right here. One of the most famous parts of the Battle of Gettysburg is Pickett's Charge, uh, led by this guy, George Pickett. He launches a, an attempt to attack the Union line and fails. He and his entire regiment die. Uh, and it's a valiant effort, but it ends in a loss, not just of Pickett and his regiment, but f a loss for the Confederates at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, this became pretty critical because they never came so close to directly attacking the North again, and it really ends their last chance they have of really winning the war. From this point on, things are going to start going downhill. 
Meanwhile, the war in the West is progressing pretty nicely for the Union at this point. Uh, they're led in the West, as you can see here, they're making progression down the Mississippi River, which was part of the Anaconda Plan, and they're led in the West by a guy named Ulysses S. Grant. Now, Grant had been at West Point with Lee and a lot of these other guys, uh, was never a great student, often dressed in a kind of a frumpy fashion, uh, and became an alcoholic after his service in the Mexican War of 1848. For the alcoholism, he's kicked out of the army, he tries his hand at business, fails, and is working for his dad when the, when the Civil War starts. Uh, when he comes back into the army, he gets a second chance, and with that second chance becomes a very bold leader who's idolized by his troops. Now, Grant had won a series of battles in Tennessee and then made his way on to Mississippi. The thing about Grant that was interesting, though, is that later in the war, the media nicknames him the Butcher for the reckless abandon he would use and just throwing his troops into the fire and into the battle and just overwhelming the enemy with numbers no matter how many died. But the Butcher fainted at the sight of blood. He hated it. Uh, couldn't handle blood. Couldn't even take his steak rare. Uh, if he saw blood at all, he'd get wheezy. Just a, one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard of. Uh, he always demanded unconditional surrender when he won, so he offered no terms, no provisions or graces to the enemy. He just would say, you're crushed, you're beaten, I win, and you don't get any help from me on any of it. For the record, alcohol never did get in the way. Uh, Lincoln loved his desire to fight, and Grant uh, paid him off handsomely. Now, at this time, Grant is not in charge of the entire Union Army. That doesn't happen until 1864. But while he's in the West, some good things happen. A guy named David Farragut has a major, major victory in New Orleans, right down here on the bottom of the map. You can barely see it. And the reason this is big is because it's the opening to the Mississippi River. Confederate ships, even if they made it through the blockade, now cannot get uh, passage up the river, nor can anybody from here or here in the Confederacy use the river for any traffic or access. It effectively will split the Confederacy right here and here so that uh, they're cut off from each other and can't communicate. But there's still one last uh, big fort that has to be taken, and it's right here, Vicksburg, Mississippi. I guess you can't really call it a fort, but it's a critical point in the river itself. And that is led to Ulysses S. Grant. After he does well at Fort, Fort Henry, struggles a little bit at Shiloh, and makes his way down the Mississippi River here, at Vicksburg, he lays siege to the city. Now, Vicksburg is the first real example in the Civil War of total war. And in a total war concept, you are targeting civilians. He bombed them out repeatedly for days until they got to the point that they had to live in hillside holes and huts, and had to eat mules and rats and dogs and things like that for dinner. Eventually, just attacking civilians leads to a quick end, and Vicksburg is taken on the 4th of July, 1863, just one day after Gettysburg. Now, between those two victories, Gettysburg and Vicksburg, the war starts turning in favor of the Union. Grant makes his way back up to Tennessee and does well at the Battle of Chattanooga, as well as some other battles here. Now, when he does take this battle, uh, when he takes the battle at uh, Chattanooga, he's named the commander of all Union forces in the East, and he needs help from this guy right here, William T. Sherman, who was also a former alcoholic, a support friend of Ulysses S. Grant's, and frankly, some people would say a little mentally unstable. The reason was stuff like this. Sherman was put in charge of the march to the sea through Georgia. Remember, that was part of the Anaconda plan, was divided to the south again. Sherman captures Atlanta, burns it to the ground to destroy Confederate morale, because Atlanta was their New York. It was their crown jewel city. And he go, lives off the land, burning the countryside in terms of houses, heating up railways and twisting them up into Sherman pretzels, taking down communication lines and doing this all on a wide path to the sea. I mean, this is about 60 miles wide here. And he's doing this from Atlanta, marching all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, and eventually ending up in Savannah, Georgia. 
So with nowhere else to go, what does he do? Well, once he hits the sea, he turns north. So as far as he was concerned, South Carolina had started the war. South Carolina had seceded first. Fort Sumter had happened in South Carolina, and Sherman did not like South Carolina. So with orders, he chases Confederate General Joe Johnston through South Carolina, doing the exact same thing he had just done in Georgia, and eventually getting Johnson to surrender in North Carolina. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching.